they strike without warning. Beneath the surface of our oceans, underwater earthquakes unleash some of the most catastrophic disasters ever recorded. In 2004, an undersea quake near Sumatra triggered a tsunami that swept across the Indian Ocean, killing over 230,000 people in 14 countries. In 2011, a similar event struck Japan, leaving 18,000 dead and sparking a nuclear meltdown at Fukushima. These weren't just natural disasters, they were planetary-scale events, collapsing economies, altering coastlines, and shifting global power dynamics. Now, scientists warn of another hidden danger, quietly waiting off the western coast of North America, the Cascadia subduction zone. Stretching from Northern California to British Columbia, this tectonic time bomb lies just offshore, and when it fails, the consequences could be global. At 9.41 a.m., without warning, the Cascadia subduction zone ruptures. A deep, grinding shift occurs as the Pacific Plate thrusts beneath the North American Plate, releasing centuries of accumulated pressure in an instant. A megathrust earthquake, reaching magnitude 9.0 or higher, explodes along a 1,000-kilometer fault line beneath the Pacific Ocean. The rupture races from Northern California to Vancouver Island, shaking everything in its path. The Earth convulses violently. In an instant, the Pacific Northwest is under siege. In Portland, glass shatters as office towers lurch side to side. In Seattle, roads ripple and crack open. Entire sections of freeway crumble. Massive bridges, once thought unshakable, twist, buckle, and collapse into the rivers below. In Victoria, the shaking is relentless. Buildings groan, bricks fall, storefronts split apart. For five long minutes, the ground moves like liquid. Not seconds, minutes. Alarms blare, people scream, and structures everywhere are pushed to the edge. In those moments, tens of thousands across the region are thrown into a desperate struggle to survive, with no idea that worse is still to come. In the minutes after the quake, there's a strange, heavy silence, followed by confusion, then panic. Communication networks are down, cell towers have fallen, power grids fail across cities and towns. Without information or instruction, people are left to navigate the chaos on their own. Emergency services, already impacted by the shaking, are stretched thin. Some fire stations and hospitals are damaged or completely inaccessible, First responders face blocked roads, damaged equipment, and limited coordination. Then the ground begins to change again, this time driven by forces deep below. In soft, water-saturated areas, the soil begins to liquefy. Homes tilt, roads buckle, entire neighborhoods slowly sink into the ground. Gas lines rupture under city streets. Fires break out, spreading across districts where water pressure is gone and fire crews can't reach them. Airports close, runways crack, hospitals, running on backup power, begin evacuating patients into parking lots. Tens of thousands are injured, thousands are already dead. And while the region reels from the impact, another danger, much larger, is already in motion offshore. Out at sea, the energy released by the earthquake has shifted the ocean itself. Within minutes, water begins to draw back from the coast, exposing the seabed and shipwrecks unseen in decades. For those who know what it means, there's barely time to run. On the Pacific Northwest coast, a wall of water begins to form, reaching over 100 feet high. When it hits, it moves with staggering force, carrying buildings, cars, and entire communities with it. Coastal towns like Newport, Crescent City, Long Beach, and Tofino take the full impact. Streets vanish beneath churning waves. Wooden homes are shattered. Concrete structures are torn from their foundations. Entire neighborhoods are gone in minutes. At naval bases and industrial ports, the destruction continues. Ships are ripped from moorings and thrown inland. 
oil storage tanks rupture, fires ignite. Infrastructure built to withstand storms is no match for this force. Across hundreds of miles of coastline, the tsunami leaves behind silence, debris, and unimaginable loss. But it doesn't end there. The waves keep traveling, far beyond North America's shores. As the waves crash into North America, the tsunami continues outward, traveling across the Pacific at speeds nearing 800 kilometers per hour. Hours before impact, sensors detect the energy moving underneath the sea, and alerts are issued across the region. In Hawaii, sirens sound across islands. Highways jam as residents head inland. Still, the wave arrives with force. In places like Waikiki, it reaches over 20 feet. Hotels flood. Critical infrastructure is damaged. Cleanup and recovery will take months. Further west, Japan, still scarred by its own 2011 Fukushima disaster, shuts down major ports and evacuates entire coastal prefectures. Fishing vessels scramble to open water. Across Australia, New Zealand, Chile, and Indonesia, coastlines are struck with varying severity. Harbors flood, boats are lost, wharves and piers crumble. Though the earthquake occurred off the coast of North America, the tsunami has become a global event. Across the Pacific, economies pause, trade routes falter, and communities along the Ring of Fire are left dealing with a disaster that began an ocean away. The destruction is massive, but the economic consequences are only beginning to surface. With the west coast of North America offline, three major trade hubs, Seattle, Portland and Vancouver, are no longer functioning. Cargo terminals are flooded or destroyed, rail and trucking routes are severed, Supply chains linked to Asia stall almost immediately. Tech giants like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google face outages and delays. Data centers and distribution hubs sit in damaged zones. Semiconductor shipments halt. With one break in the chain, global technology production slows. Stock markets react quickly. Volatility spikes. Markets fall. Canada's oil and gas exports, much of which pass through British Columbia's ports, are delayed. In parts of Asia, fuel shortages begin. Prices rise. Governments scramble to reroute energy and food supplies through already stretched networks. The Port of Los Angeles, still operational, becomes overwhelmed. Ships rerouted from the north arrive with nowhere to dock. Backlogs stretch for weeks. Insurance companies, hit by unprecedented claims, begin to default. Banking sectors, already fragile, feel the pressure. In a globalized world, one tectonic shift can shake financial systems across continents. As emergency response efforts ramp up across the Pacific Northwest, the United States turns inward, focused on rescue, repair, and recovery. In that moment of distraction, global dynamics begin to shift. China expands its naval presence in the South China Sea, taking advantage of reduced American visibility in the Pacific. North Korea conducts missile tests, signaling strength. Cyber attacks, some coordinated, begin targeting infrastructure across Europe and North America, probing for weakness in the midst of crisis. With major West Coast ports offline and parts of the U.S. Navy fleet damaged or redeployed, NATO operations slow. The coordination of international aid becomes more difficult. Diplomacy stalls in places where quick action is needed most. Back home, a humanitarian crisis unfolds. Tens of thousands are displaced along the coast. Airports become temporary shelters. Military convoys carry supplies up and down the I-5 corridor. Martial law is declared in parts of Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. Field hospitals and refugee camps rise in stadiums, schools, and military bases. In one of the world's most developed nations, the scene now resembles that of a war zone. This isn't a theoretical scenario. It's rooted in geological history and growing scientific consensus. In January of the year 1700, 
the Cascadia subduction zone ruptured in a massive earthquake. Japanese records describe a tsunami arriving on their shores with no local quake to explain it. Centuries later, modern science confirmed the source, a megathrust event in the Pacific Northwest. Today, the same fault is locked again, quiet but steadily building pressure. According to seismologists, there's a 10 to 15% chance of a full-scale magnitude 9.0 quake within the next 50 years. The chance of a smaller, yet still devastating magnitude 8.0 event is closer to one in three. Despite these warnings, many cities across the region remain underprepared. Bridges, schools, and hospitals, many were built without accounting for an event of this scale. Emergency planning varies widely, and in many communities, evacuation routes or warning systems are still limited. We know the science. We understand the risk. The time to act comes well before the shaking starts. The Cascadia subduction zone is quiet now, still and hidden below the sea. But silence doesn't mean safety. It means time. Time to prepare. Time to strengthen what can still be protected. We can't stop the earthquake but we can choose how ready we are when it comes. This is Doomsday Broadcast. Subscribe for more grounded insights into the risks we face and the resilience we can build. Because awareness isn't fear, it's the first step toward survival.